Okay, I guess I can go home now. Um, thank you very much for that. That's, that makes me feel really welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Scott, for the introduction and the uh, little lesson there. I appreciate that very much. And John, thank you. Thanks to Sam Weller for bringing me here. Um, thank you all for coming out on such a beautiful, beautiful day and not going to the football game. Um, I appreciate it very much. <clears throat> Traditionally, my, my programs, um, I read my victim impact statement that I, I shared with the court at Russell Henderson's sentencing, and I talk about the situation in the gay community, the civil rights that are denied the gay community, the hate crimes committed against the gay community, Matt's life, um, our life in Wyoming, and what we can do as citizens to try to make things right. Uh, however, this is a little different than what, uh, what I usually feel I need to do. I think that you wouldn't be here if you didn't already know all of that or most of that and are on the same page as me, no pun intended. Um, so what I would like to do is explain why I wrote the book when I did, the title especially, perhaps. Um, and then I'm gonna open the floor to questions and I hope that's okay with all of you. Uh, I know you must have some. The only two rules, it really is a question and a question that I have the least bit of chance to answer. Uh, I don't know how to change people's minds yet. I'm working on it, but I'm, I'm not quite there yet. So please be patient if I struggle to find a definitive answer to some of your questions. Um, this October will be 11 years since Matthew's murder. And um, some days it seems like yesterday and some days it seems like 100 years ago. Uh, it never really goes away. It just gets different as time goes by. Uh, we miss him terribly. He was a terrific young man, smart, funny, handsome, loving, uh, affectionate, empathetic, generous, all the good things a person should be, uh, and a good citizen. He had uh, disappointments in his life. He suffered with depression for a good part of his life. He had very many extraordinary the bad things happened to him and good things as well. So in his short 21 year life, he had a, he, he would say he'd lived a lifetime. Um, I, I chose to wrote, write the book when I did because um, several things came together. I met a book agent. Uh, we did a dramatic read of the Laramie Project in New York City on what would have been Matt's birthday, uh, December 1st, 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2006. And a lot of uh, potential publishers came to the production, became very interested in Matt's story, so I ended up with a publisher as well. I wanted to write a book of letters first because so many really wonderful people wrote beautiful, beautiful notes and letters to us while Matt was in the hospital and shortly after he passed away. And I wanted to share them because easily over half of them were not from the gay community, not from the gay community, and they were from around the world. Uh, all walks of life, from every profession you can imagine, every religion, every ethnicity, uh, every race, every kind of life you can imagine, expressing their horror at what had happened to Matt, that that was even possible. Obviously, they were oblivious to the fact that it happens all the time, uh, hate-related crimes, and not just to the gay community. Hate is not a gay thing. It happens based on race, religion, ethnicity, uh, the categories that apparently are not listed in the Utah hate crime bill. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> which is unfortunate because without the listing, the bill is kind of pointless. So uh, I wanted to share them, but my agent felt that I needed to talk about the last 10 years before I did the book of letters. So uh, I thought about it, I mulled it over, I spoke to Dennis, my husband, Matt's dad, and uh, Arthur and Logan, and we decided you know, we would try to do it. We would work kind of together to correlate timelines, memories, because. I was having a hard time keeping things in the right order. So, well, that's almost impossible to do, right? You, you're there and you're living it and then you look back and you're going, I don't remember who came when, 
I don't remember whether it was morning or night. I, there was so much happening all at once and we were actually not focused on anything except what was happening in Matt's room. So uh, I know a wonderful young man named John Barrett, who's actually from Idaho, who's now the editor-in-chief of the Advocate magazine. It's sort of the gay and lesbian version of Time magazine. And uh, we've been friends for a long time. He wrote the first, one of the first print interviews I did uh, with the press. We sort of felt a kinship thing from the Intermountain West, um, growing up in places where maybe the gay community is not so understood or welcomed. I trusted him implicitly. I knew I wasn't going to have to tell the story from the beginning if I worked with John. So we worked together. He, we would talk and talk and talk, and then he would send me transcriptions of the conversations written in a way that he writes, and then I would read it and change it to the way I talk. And he would say, well, Judy, sometimes these aren't really grammatically you know, correct. And I said, you know, that's OK. I don't talk totally grammatically correct all the time. I want this book to be conversational. I want the reader to feel like I am telling him the story. Uh, I hope that's how it turned out. Um, and I wanted to do it from the point of view of the family, uh, actually mostly, mostly mine, since I'm the one that's been doing this. Uh, Dennis had to have a real job, so he stayed in Saudi to work. Logan went on to school, and I became the voice. So, um, so that's how the book came about. Uh, the book of letters will follow, I hope, soon. The title, uh, The Meaning of Matthew, um, is because you all knew him as Matthew, but to, he was Matt to us. He was Matt to his family and friends, never Matthew. He could have been Maddie or Mateo, but never Matthew. And I feel that your Matthew is pretty one-dimensional and sometimes really not correct. He was not angelic. He was not perfect. He was actually quite troublesome sometimes. Um, the interesting thing about writing the book is that having to go back and visit the memories of 10 years ago also opened the floodgates to really remarkable memories for all of us that, that needed to be recalled to, to make Matt more present to us. We began to not only talk about the good things and the funny things, but the things that really annoyed us, too. Uh, so that was a good thing. It made him actually more real to us, too. So I wanted you to meet my Matt. I wanted you to understand that he was a human being. He was a 21-year-old college student when he was killed. He smoked too much. He drank too much. He didn't go to class enough, sort of like other college students, like me, for instance. Um, he had suffered with depression, as I said earlier. He had, uh, he had issues in his life. And I wanted other members of the community and his friends to understand that these things happen to Matt, too. Uh, in the gay community in particular, we see a higher percentage of depression and, and issues with self-esteem because society indoctrinates us that being gay is somehow wrong, when really it isn't. Uh, the only difference between being gay and straight is who you love. And at the end of the day, does that really matter? No, it does not. You are who you are, and that's just the way it is. I wanted you to understand how we felt about him, how Matt's process, what his life was like in the coming out process, as brief as that was for him. So um, I hope if you've not already read the book that you do read it, and that if you are an ally to the community or a member of the community, that what I want you to take away from the book is that the only way we're going to be able to change things for the gay community to make it better, to make it right, is we all have to tell our stories. We all have to tell what our lives are like and what our lives are about. Uh, even, even allies, even parents, family, and friends, you have to share the stories of your loved ones who are part of the community. Because otherwise, the stereotype will be the only thing that lives. And the gay community is not the stereotype. If you mention the gay community, someone whose ignorance is, is still there, what they're going to envision is the village people. The gay community is not the village people. <laughs> we are your pastors, your doctors, your policemen, your firemen, your teachers, your politicians. We are everywhere, always have been, always will be. So we have to overcome the stereotype. Ignorance is our worst enemy. And even in climates where being gay is not particularly welcome or accepted, we have to start somewhere. And if we don't do it, who's going to? And that's what I want you to take away from the book. And that's why I wrote the book, and that was my process. <laughs>